My name is Eva Górska and this is Reorient Podcast. This episode was created as part of the project Empathy. Let's empower, participate and teach each other to hype empathy. Challenging discourse about Islam and Muslims in Poland. The project is funded by the European Union. Welcome to the Reorient podcast. It's the first episode that is recorded in English and not in Polish. So we see how it goes. And it will be recorded in English because I'm here with Professor Maurits Berger from Netherlands, who is actually teaching about Islam in Europe and has been doing that for years. I'm just going to give you a voice in a second um, to to introduce yourself because you will do it better, Maurits. But um, yeah, so I wanted really to have that conversation, to record that conversation and uh, see how it goes and also see how it works for the Polish audience um, if we record something in English. So how? hi, Maurits. Hi. Can you tell us who are you and why why are you teaching Islam in the West or where are you teaching and what happened that you got here? Okay, my name is Moritz Berger and I'm a a professor of Islam in the West at Leiden University. And I am doing that since 2008. I'm also with university since 2008. Before that, I've been into multiple jobs. I have a kind of a patchwork career. My background is in law and Arabic. I specialize in Islamic law. I work with a law firm for a while. I worked as a journalist for a while. I spent altogether eight years in the Middle East, in Egypt, Syria. worked several jobs down there and gradually started also, I, I did some writing all the time and worked on my PhD. A lot of teaching. Every time I was in the Netherlands, I did teachings mostly on Islamic law. And the interesting thing was that Islamic law at the time was of no relevance Mm. for a a European perspective. In 2002, I moved back to the Netherlands. I joined in, uh, it was the Klingendal Institute for International Relations. So I was mostly into foreign policy. There was a focus on Middle East, but that quickly, well, kind of focused back to the European situation. We are past September 11th and actually when you ask, why are you teaching Islam? Because I'm not a specialist of Islam. I'm not. I'm not a theologian. I'm not religious studies. It's thanks to Osama bin Laden. Everyone was completely focused on Islam. The main explanation for what's happening to Muslims and to understand who those fellow Europeans were was Islam. And although I've all, I spent most of my time as a professor of Islam telling people that it has nothing to do with Islam which I think is no important part of my job. But that's the way, so there's a, a, a long story of, of, of how I got here. Well, I think there's one part missing, if you're fine speaking about it. So I'm wondering, how did you start? Why did you choose Arabic and Islamic law? Which is important for me because I did the same years ago. But I wonder what leads you to, to choosing that? I actually wanted to become an engineer. I studied math and physics and I failed miserably. And then I moved to law, which I truly enjoyed. How do you move from engineering to law and truly enjoy because that? All, you know, I, I graduated with physics and chemistry and math and everything. And then I realized if I fail at university, math and physics, then there's no need for me to try any other job like an architect or an engineer. So I really, it was, I mean, it was a major crisis. I had to move to a completely different field. And that's why I moved to law. And I took Arabic as uh, an evening course because I like writing and writing with, I I wrote with ink and I was a little bit of a nerd. So I wrote like Leonardo da Vinci from the right to the left and that kind of stuff. I really like to do that. And and, and I wrote stories and always with ink and, and, and the old fashioned pen. And that's why I like the calligraphy. I took the course and then very Dutch. Um, It was cheaper to take the course as a second major. Mm -hmm. I studied Arabic and then a completely unknown world opened because I got philosophy, I got the history, I got the... And I was completely mesmerized. I really enjoyed that. And then I combined the two, law and Arabic, and I got into Islamic law. It's Mm -hmm. just from one thing to another. Yeah, I can relate to that. (laughs) Uh, I understand. 
Okay, so let's move a bit farther because I'm still interested in the personal uh, route. I usually do this podcast with Polish guests, you know, speaking only about science and their latest research or a specific issue uh, that they're researching. But with you, I think, like, let's be honest, I read your work before and then I met you and it's your career and your choices are really interesting. So you graduated And you became a lawyer or you became a journalist? No, I became, at first I was one year unemployed, which was very good for my humility. I, I had been sweeping floors and all that kind of thing. And then I got accepted in one of those hotshot law, law firms, you know, the hotshot law firms, that, which was fascinating and I became utterly miserable. And I actually, to be honest, I, I applied for specifically those kind of law firms because that I, I hoped through them to get to the Middle East. Because some of them had branch offices in the Middle East. Because I really, I was fixated on the Middle East. I wanted to go to the Middle East. As a student, I had spent quite some time there, more than a year. And I was completely hooked. So I wanted to go mm. back. And I thought, okay, my way is through those law firms. But then the law firm itself, I, I, I became miserable. So I, 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 I went by myself. Okay, so why did you get hooked on the Middle East? It's a mixture of, and I have to be honest, I guess it's a little bit of the, what we in the old times called the Orientalism. So it's mm -hmm. the, more the, the, the Romanticism, mm -hmm. the Lawrence of Arabia kind of thing. And I detested those guys. I thought that was not honest, etc. But still, if I'm very honest with myself, it's a kind of that to the exoticism, mm -hmm. these kind of things. But also because I was told in law firm that I was not well professionally because of certain personal characteristics which work perfectly fine in the middle east mm -hmm. and vice versa so somehow there was a part of me that kind of matched with the middle east and well and i, I guess it's also a general idea of adventure mm -hmm. and and there's another world to explore and gradually one of the most fascinating things for me was the more I, time I spend in the Middle East, the more I realized how, how Dutch I actually am. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I, that was a shocker to me because I did not want to be Dutch. I wanted to be different, but I'm very, very, very Dutch. It's good to realize that. Was there a part also of deconstructing some myths and stereotypes about Middle East and Islam or at that time? Well, I'm thinking uh, about now, especially like contemporary times. So in Europe, we are bombarded with negative stereotypes about Islam. And then going to the Middle East, for example, for me was a lot of deconstructing of what I learned. Even the theory I learned uh, at the university, it didn't really fit totally the reality on the ground. But I'm wondering if, you know, I think before it was the same or not. We are, we are really different generations. Yeah. In my time, there was little known about the Middle East. And what was known was negative because that mm -hmm. was the, the setting was, the, the framework was the Israeli-Palestine conflict, which we hardly hear about that nowadays. That time, that was the thing. So all journalists, and who were called journalists for the Middle East, were all working from Israel. Mm -hmm. They would never venture out into any Arab world. They hardly spoke any Arabic. But that for us was the Middle East, and especially also for the Dutch. We were, still are to a certain extent, very pro-Israeli. So that was our focus. But th these negative stereotypes you're talking about, I would say the much less. You know, the interesting, the other interesting thing was the way I studied Arabic was also the old, what we called Orientalism at the time, mm. was texts. Yeah, We only worked through text. I've been reading like crazy. But the interesting, we never met a Muslim, which is also, a, a, especially a Western European tradition, right? Mm -hmm. So for centuries, we have had professors studying Islam and Arabs. They've never met a Muslim or an Arab. Yeah, And never went there. Never went yeah. there. It's all books. Mm -hmm. And that was my world. It was a bookish world. And I only later that I realized that I could have met some Muslims who were living in some other neighborhoods, but I never went there, so I didn't know. So once I got on the plane to Morocco and to Egypt and to Syria, that was my first encounter. And then I realized that I had had quite a few professors who were in love with Arab culture, but disliked Arabs. So the Arab culture was, you know, the civilization mm -hmm. and all the stuff from the books, but they actually didn't like going there. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was 
was a very particular choice because I, I remember it being in a plane and thinking, if I have that same experience, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to do because if I don't like the people, mm-hmm. then I don't want to get further into the subject. But I did like the people. And even then we have to say, so I, live, I lived in Egypt and then I lived in Syria. I have more preference for Syria. They are worlds apart in, in character and in, in nature. And then again, there's Moroccans, yet another. So there's the Arab I still need to meet because they don't exist. And so mm-hmm. to the extent that there are so many peoples living there. But I really, I felt at home, very much so. I know the feeling. Mm. So how come you started studying Islamic law in Egypt, I guess, and also in Damascus. I, well, I started in the Leiden Library. Okay. So the books. Yeah. And then I had already the very peculiar feeling. So I start, started in the Leiden Library in the books. One of the things I uh, did was, uh, it was a huge project that the professor got me into, was the translation into Dutch of the Moroccan family code mm-hmm. into legal Dutch. And that's still being used by, it's, it's, it's the translation used by the courts in the Netherlands because we had at the time a lot of those court cases. But I always had this feeling that, that I did not really understand. There were some, to my mind, illogical things in that law, which is of course absurd. I mean, these are well-known scholars who, medieval scholars, but you know, I didn't understand their logic. So I always had this kind of, again, romantic dream. I want to study the way they study. I want to study with the sheikh in a mosque. That was my basic. And I did. I arranged that to be done. Which is, I think, very interesting because one of the critiques towards scholars in Europe uh, who are teaching or studying Islamic law is that they don't actually study the Islamic law the Islamic way. And you did. Because when you're saying that at your time, the, the professors didn't go, didn't meet the Arabs, didn't, didn't spend time on the ground, I think now it has maybe, maybe changed a bit. So more people are actually at least supposed to do empirical research on the ground, so they should go out. But when it comes to Islamic law, I would say it's still based on books and theory. And that's how I learned also. Well, that's one thing. And the other thing is... Well, Islamic law is generally, used to be in my time at least, was kind of hijacked by sociologists and anthropologists. Mm. Who, and I learned a lot from them because they had a, a different way of looking at things. Mm-hmm. They, they was, what are people doing? One of the problems I find as a lawyer, I dare to say that one of the problems with lawyers is that they think what they read, that that is the truth, mm-hmm. which is not the case. A law does not represent truth. Yeah. So the anthropologists are after the truth. What is actually happening to people? But the anthropologists very often do not understand the intrinsic logic of a law. That's one thing. But then if a lawyer starts to study Islamic law, they have their own framework that they project on this Islamic law. And then very often it doesn't fit or it doesn't work. You have to jump into that and try to understand the inherent logic of Islamic law. So what it has is it? its own logic. It is is a different ball game. It's a different way of uh, different choices have been made, different checks, different balances. One of the things I found very interesting now, for instance, is that we try to set up training programs for imams. I was responsible for one of them. Um, I, I inherited one of those programs. I was not happy with it, but I inherited one of them, and we got. We said it's, a, it's not working now. Quite a few imams are doing their PhD with me. Those imams, they are, we're talking of Moroccan or whatever origin, they're Dutch, but they had their Islamic training in Fez, Morocco, or in uh, Azhar, Egypt, or in Saudi Arabia, Medina. So they, they have that frame of mind. Now, what, what usually happens, they tell me, is that they are told that that's wrong, you have to have the other frame of mind, which is a Western academic frame of mind. And what I tell them is, well, you have to know that too. But I invite them to combine the two. So Mm -hmm. help me. Maybe you can contribute from an Islamic logic. You can contribute to a more academic logic. One plus one becomes three. Rather than get rid of one and adopt the other. And that's also what I've been trying to do. Is you really 
jump into another mind frame, so mm -hmm. to say. I found that the most exciting thing, and I later re I kind of reconstructed that was also when I studied law, I studied law at the university when the first year we had Roman law and it was even Latin and I had, had Latin. So those parts were in Latin and we had Frankish law and we studied comparative law with Swiss and German and American. I love that. And what I so much loved is because law deals with human relationships. Human relationships are the same all over the world. People marry, people divorce, they are, they have fights, they want contracts. How come that we frame those relationships so differently? These really different legal systems, that is the interesting thing. And then law actually becomes a culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very close to my heart. Also, what you're saying about giving space to the other logic. This is basically what also decolonization movements, when it comes to epistemology, are saying that we are, that, that became very scientific. But what they're saying is that we are very used to believing that our way of thinking, our law, our culture is the better one, is the dominant one, and everyone should apply that. While also in law, which I think not many lawyers realize working from Europe, is that it's not only that the rules are different, it's the logic, as you say, behind it is different. And it's it's actually so hard to understand the different logic with coming from where we come from, where we grew up in. It's so difficult to understand because we we would have to untangle everything we learned before. Yeah. But I guess that's why people go to the Middle East and stay there. Yeah, that's one thing. And there's, also, there's plenty of people who go to the Middle East and, and stay there and still retain another mind frame and look around, you know, at these funny people and they, they remain in a kind of exoticism. For, for me, what I find very exciting about these times, academically speaking, is that we, of course, I mean, Western scholars are now very much criticized for being so dominant on the other hand, what we can also say, it, the Western scholarship, I think is a very solid scholarship, is very intriguing and interesting. But we now have an opportunity to open it up uh, and to invite all kinds of other scholarships and, and pick and choose and see what is mm -hmm. the best way to understand the world around us. Yeah, it gives us so many opportunities. But how one studies Islamic law? Like, can you tell me actually how it looks like for you to study Islamic law, how it looks generally. So you go to an, to Al-Azhar or somewhere, how does the studying process look like? But also, how is it for a white guy from Europe? Is it different? Were you treated differently? Yes and no. I intended to study Islamic law at Cairo University. And uh, that was so incredibly crammed with people that I quit after a few uh, months. That was no use at all, which it was a sociological experience, mm -hmm. but in terms of academia, not much. The thing I did notice was that was at the law department and they addressed Islamic law actually very much like, well, French or any other law. That was mm -hmm. their frame of mind. And that was how they were training all the lawyers. I then went much later to the Sharia faculty in, in Damascus. And there also I was kind of disappointed. So, you know, we are reading from books. I've, I've no, I know that. That's not new to me. I talked to the dean and he said, well, if you really want to un understand how it works, you have to study with a sheikh in a mosque. And he introduced me and I, so I went over. I did not dress up like Lawrence of Arabia, it was just, but I thought I should dress up smartly and introduce me as, I'm not a Muslim, but can I study with you? Ahlam wa sahlan, no problem, sit with us. I was a foreigner, but not, not, not really conspicuous. So every morning, right after prayer, which was like five or 5.30, we would sit there all together in the mosque around a sheikh who would read from the book. And I, I those were the kind of books I've been reading in the library. And he then kind of translated the old Arabic into Syrian Arabic. So I, that's mm -hmm. how I learned my Syrian Arabic. And we would go through, and it was actually this very old, and then all of a sudden you see that it is, still based on Greek methods, mm -hmm. the way it goes back and forth, question, answer, these kind of things. 
But then they became a kind of confused after a while because the way they perceived me was as someone who was looking for the truth. Mm -hmm. So after what was like half a year, the general consensus was in that group that by now I should have realized that Islam was the best. So when was the conversion taking place? Mm -hmm. So they sent in the mufti who mm -hmm. took me apart with another student as a, that was also a fascinating discussion we had. The thing is that I have never, that for me has never been an issue mm -hmm. that I needed to convert to whatever. Not because I'm such a strong believer as a Christian, not because I dislike Islam to the country, but I realized that I had grown up in a country that is, I'm from the, I'm Catholic from the Catholic part, but I was raised in the Protestant part, so I'm already messed up. And for me, Christianity is also, it's these little churches during my cycle trips. It mm -hmm. is certain music, it's a, it's a culture. I discussed this with, with um, it was a good friend I had at the time, it was a young French Algerian woman who was completely secular. She hated everything that had to do with religion. But she said, we're talking about this conversion issues. And he said, you know, the funny thing is every time when it's Ramadan and I hear the, the Quran recitation on the radio, I get tears in my eyes. Mm. And I said, well, that's exactly, that's what I mean. That's my upbringing. So then for me, very often I've noticed that Muslims, and they keep asking me, I mean, it was like a few weeks ago, Salaso, you know so much about Islam, so why don't you convert? To me, that is always a very cerebral, very intellectual question. Mm -hmm. For me, believing has to do with the heart and not the head. So this has never been an issue. But still, so for them, that was a different ballgame. Because there's quite a few Europeans who go there to, f to seek the truth, find themselves yeah. and convert. And conversion sometimes, I don't know enough about conversion, but I have the impression that conversion is more about finding a new identity mm -hmm. and finding some kind of truth. I think also about fitting in in the end if you want to stay there and you know so much about it. Didn't they feel that you're kind of refusing or not respecting their religion if in the end you don't want to convert? No, it was not the disrespect, but it was... It, so I'm talking now about a community of very... of believers. Mm. And for them, if you're kind of emerged, submerged, soaked in belief, and you still don't see the light, then there's something wrong with you. And yeah. so it's not a disrespect, but mm -hmm. what's wrong with you? I have this conversation more with Muslims in the Netherlands, my, mm -hmm. my own students, every time. And that's actually very interesting as well, because that's the difference between Poland and the Netherlands, is that you're actually also teaching Muslim yeah. students. We don't have that. So we teach about Islam as something totally foreign. Or if we do, they wouldn't say probably that they're Muslim. Yeah. Um, and it's it's yeah. it's fascinating to do that kind of teaching because one of the things is uh, when I studied it, it was always about them mm. yeah. and out there and it was something foreign. But now it was here. It's my colleagues. It's my students. It's you. It's us. And that is interesting. So that's one thing. So uh, for instance, I teach Introduction to Islam, 150 students every year. And I would say one third is Muslim. Now, among them, quite a few believers. Mm -hmm. There's also a number of non-Muslims who are not only non-believers, they are also very, they dislike mm -hmm. Islam or distrust Islam or they're worried, they have their concerns. So one of the things I've done is in the week before this, this lecture, I do an online anonymous survey. Three questions. What is it you want to know about Islam? Are there things that worry you about Islam? To what extent do you know Muslims? Now, the last question is, you know immediately who the Muslims are and who mm. are not. The non-Muslims don't know any Muslims. Yes, maybe their colleague. Mm -hmm. But the middle question is interesting, concerns. Mm -hmm. And at one time, there was this one answer was, I'm concerned that the white professor is teaching us about Islam. Which would be my concern as well. So I put that on the board in the first lecture. I said, okay, let's start with this. And then, so I assume this is about me because I am a white professor. And then the next assumption is, apparently, that I'm not a Muslim. How do you know? Because already 
mm-hmm. Islam is somehow connected to color. It's racialized. It's racialized, which is... And Malcolm X, you know, mm-hmm. the, the Muslim, black Muslim activist from the United States, was in an utter culture shock when he arrived in Mecca for the pilgrimage and met so many white Muslims. Because for him, Islam had to do in the fight of, against discrimination. And discrimination was white versus black. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so when I say this, you see, you see this. Among those students, oh my God, okay. And they all start to flip open their laptops and start Googling me and <laughs> been in a mosque here, studied him. Maybe he is a Muslim. So then I say, okay, let's assume I'm not a Muslim. Who among you would then think that these lessons might not really be good or valuable or whatever? And then the Muslims would raise their fingers. Okay, now let's assume I'm a Muslim. Who would then kind of not really... Then all of the non-Muslims would raise their fingers. If, if a Muslim is teaching Islam, well, then mm. it would be biased and all of that. What, and the interesting thing, I say, I have not said anything yet. I haven't done anything. I haven't started teaching. And you already made up your mind. Mm-hmm. So why don't we, why don't I explain to you how I'm going to teach and what I'm going to teach? You give me just a bit of slack, first lectures, and then, then we'll see. So for me, this was a way of kind of opening up. And yes, I think it, it, sometimes it makes sense to be a Muslim, to teach Islam. Sometimes it does not make sense. The best way is to combine. Mm-hmm. So what I now do, I, have, I happen to be a non-Muslim white professor. Most of my Muslim friends tell me you're already a Muslim. So, okay, sure, I don't mind. And I invite various Muslims. Now, next semester, I w- there will be, I will have a fellow from China. So she's mm-hmm. going to teach about Islam in China. I have one from Kenya who happens to study, uh, to be a researcher in Finland. Mm. So she has some interesting experiences. So we're going to combine all of that. And here we are back to what we started with is the more you can combine the, the, the experiences, more eyes, more, more ears, the more closer we get to the truth of what all this Islam is actually about. I think it also makes this important point in itself that Islam varies and there's just, yeah. apart from getting to the truth, if we can ever get to the truth, there's no one Islam. It's just... There isn't, but there's also like, and I, I'm, I'm frank about that. I said, listen, if it's about in teaching Islam, I cannot express, I cannot teach this this sensation, this this of what it is to be a believer mm. and what it means to a person. You need someone else for that. Mm-hmm. But if you have that person teaching Islam, that person will never be able to identify with the concerns that non-believers have. Mm-hmm. They would think that's ridiculous. They would think it's Islamophobic. But sometimes Islamophobia is used too easily. Mm-hmm. I mean, there may be genuine concerns, so we have to address them too. And then I am more fit to do that. It's a, it's a very odd thing. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you and I would be looked at as someone with knowledge and your teaching. Now they look at us of who are these people? Mm-hmm. Identification first. Are you white? Are you old? Are you young? Are you Muslim? Are you not Muslim? And before you have said a word, already judgment is passed. And can you do it or can you not? And there may be more to it. On the other hand, the fact that that happens makes, for instance, I do a lot of teaching to, for police officers. I, when it comes to Islamophobia, I can do more mm-hmm. than a Muslim believer could do. Yeah, because they won't listen. They Exactly. Yeah. But that's, that's where I want to get as well, Islamophobia. Because it's different in different countries. So what we have in Poland is sometimes called a platonic Islamophobia. There's not many Muslims. People don't know Muslims. They're afraid because of the general fears of Islam in Europe, of what the media are saying, of the politicians are using it in populist narratives before the elections to scare the people. And then people, that, that's how they get their knowledge. We don't have other sources of knowledge. All of that. In the Netherlands, you actually do have Muslims living in different neighborhoods and you do have also your students But at the same time, you're saying that the rest, the non-Muslims, are still having the concerns. So what are the concerns? Let's start with that. 
The interesting thing, because that's the third question I always ask, to what extent do you know or do you interact with Muslims? Because mm. that that's a crucial difference. Yeah. Those people who know don't have those concerns. Yeah. So the voters for, we have one or two Islamophobic parties, uh, or of Islamic forward. Those are parties who are very much critical and against Islam and these kind of... Their constituency is from areas in the Netherlands where there's hardly any Muslim. Mm -hmm. So that will be your, your platonic yeah. Islamophobia. The more interaction there is, the, the more people know fellow Muslims, the more it goes away. Yeah. And it is happening. Contact. And one of the... Yes, yeah. but one of the interesting things I find in the Netherlands is, and this very often when I have, when I have a, a Muslim audience, I tell them yes, and the criticism and all, all the stuff that's being said about you or about Islam, it can be horrible. And on the other hand, never ever in, I would say, Dutch history, definitely, but perhaps history, has community, in this case, Muslim community, within one generation reached the upper strata of society, mm. right? So if you look, so we have people who came in as migrants or children of migrants who are now mayors, ministers, members of parliament, and I'm not even talking about lawyers, doctors, that's quite something. Still not enough. I mean, Islamophobia is still there. It can be rampant. So, so that makes it, I mean, if you just look at women, if you look at Jews, in our, our, the way they had to fight their way up, generations, and they're still not there. So that's special. Mm -hmm. So that's extra points. Again, we are still not there. Mm -hmm. There's still quite a way to go. So we, when was this? A few years ago, we had the first member of parliament wearing a headscarf. She got vilified mm -hmm. really bad by fellow parliamentarians. But she stood the ground, good for her, she's there. So it, it takes steps, it takes time. So if, if you take the more historical approach, is it is going the right way? If you're take, taking the more personal view, it's, well, for those who are living in these particular times, it's not nice at all. Mm -hmm. Because what are your chances and your possibilities, etc. Let's go back again to, to the concerns And Islamophobia, because I think a very important thing that you said a few minutes ago is that not all of the concerns about Islam are Islamophobic. So you actually can have concerns. So what's the difference in between? Okay, for, for, I find Islamophobia a difficult term because mm. uh, it has evolved and it mm -hmm. covers different things. What we have in the Netherlands is quite a lot of criticism of Islam itself as a religion, which... I would say most of the time is an artificial or indirect way to criticize Muslims, right? Yeah. Um, and then there is just concerns about Muslims as foreigners and they, they take our jobs and they are different, so et cetera. So economic fear. Economic. Yeah. So you get a mixture of all of those, those kind of things. So on the one hand is what we used to call on the, the general denominator of discrimination. So these are people who are foreign. Mm -hmm. Foreigners come in and they take our jobs and they can, so from our perspective, it can be Polish people, mm -hmm. right? And it can be Spanish people. It can be people from Suriname, from Indonesia. It can be from Morocco and Turkey. It just happens that right now it's, I would say, a bit more of a Muslim or they're more well, visible. No, but then, that, no, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Th that's the discrimination part. That's all okay. over. Now, it becomes worse for the Muslims because there's something extra. Mm -hmm. And that is Islam. And mm -hmm. Islam is then seen as a religion that carries values with it that are contrary to everything that we have. So mm -hmm. if you are a believer of Islam, you're holding values that will make you unable to ever become part of this society. And if you are part of this society, well, are you then not someone who wants to steer this society towards those values of Islam, which we do not want? That's the logic of this kind of criticism. And, and the, the logic of the European Tribunal of Human Rights, unfortunately, as well. But let's unpack it. You know about Islam. So is Islam so different and it cannot be combined at any way with European values? Okay, now I'm going to be very blunt here. Yeah. Islam, if we discuss Islam as a religion, mm -hmm. so a theological construct, then Islam is very often in contrast with or in violation of our, our democratic values. 
just as Catholicism is, Mm -hmm. as Protestantism is, as Judaism is. With all due respect for all the religions, position of women is not the way we hold position of women now. Uh, The notion of democracy doesn't exist and religions don't do democracy. Mm -hmm. So for me, this is the wrong question. The question is not what does a religion say about these values. I don't care about the beliefs. I care about the believers. Mm -hmm. What do the believers say? So what do Catholics say about democracy, about human rights, about the position of women, about abortion, all these issues? What do Jews say? What, how they reconcile that with their religion? That's their internal issue. Yeah. Academically, very interesting, but for a public debate, it's not. For a public and political debate, I'm only concerned with what the believers come up with. So in our country, Catholics were very long, for a long time, Catholics were mistrusted. But they are not really Democrats. Mm -hmm. Also because the Pope had said all kinds of stuff against democracy, against human rights. So they are not the real real deal. But one of the first political parties we had was a Catholic party. And it turned out that they were, okay, well, that was okay. So they were judged on their political ideology, not on their theological ideology. Mm -hmm. And we do not do that with Muslims. So as soon as there is a discussion on Islam, it's, it's immediately about the theology. And I would say this is a typical European thing. I, I, I've written this book, uh, History of Islam in Europe. And this is, we have been obsessed as Europeans, obsessed with Muslims who we have never met, mm-hmm. always through Islam. So we've always judged Muslims on the basis of Islam. And we continue to do so. But why is that? What's the difference? Because we were anti-Semitic before. We still are in Europe generally, but we were before. And some scholars say that Islamophobia is development based on anti-Semitism. It just, we switched. No, but I, I wouldn't agree. No, I, I disagree yeah. as well. Yeah, it's exactly. a different thing. No, it's a completely different thing. Anti-Semitism, if you look, look back in history, when with Christianity for a long time, I would say until the 19th century, would divide the world in two. There's Christianity and there's the pagans, Mm -hmm. the others. Jews were always an in-between. Jews were kind of the prelude to Christianity. But if you look at the very, that's positively seen, negatively seen, they killed Jesus, these kind of things. So it was always a very odd creature in Christian society in Europe. Muslims were out there. And for a long time, the Christians would not know how to deal with Islam. They could not set it aside as some odd paganism because it was clearly well organized. They had a solid theology and they were conquering the world. So apparently they had God on their side. So they had to deal with that. So it was always the two are apart, Judaism and Mm -hmm. and, and Islam. The way we're treated was very much different. So again, so what's what's there about Islam or is it the media or is it the terrorism or is it something else that makes Islam so so scary, such a folk devil for everyone here? I think we can get a lot of explanation from the way we have historically treated Muslims and Islam. But the thing is, there's a difference between Muslims and Islam. Mm -hmm. The interaction with people, so the interaction with Muslims is very often projected as nonstop war. It's not true. It's just not true. Yeah. Historically, it's not true. To the contrary, very often, there have been alliances. France has had a two and a half century military alliance with the Ottomans. The Dutch had one with the Moroccans. We can go on and on about the Tatars here fought on the side of, of your king so against it. Yeah. So okay, this, this whole idea of, of a Christian European unity against an Islamic bloc is fiction. Okay. So we can historically unpack that. Why can we unpack? Because we see that there has been diplomatic ties, there have been trade. So in terms of interaction between people, the interaction have been like with any other people, among Europeans themselves, Muslims. The issue is Islam. The way people have, Europeans have discussed Islam. We had a civil war against Catholic Spain. So it was a Protestant Dutch against Catholic Spain. And the, the slogan was, we, we'd rather be Turkish than Papish. Better be a Muslim than a Catholic. 
being the Catholics being so oppressive and putting people on the stake and that kind of stuff. Well, they all knew about the Habs- about the Ottomans who would they had this religious tolerance, mm-hmm. second rate citizenship, but religious tolerance which was not seen in Europe at the time. I still have the lecture of one of my predecessors who explains this slogan. He says, yes, uh, we'd rather be Turkish than papish, but that does not mean that Islam is good. Islam is the worst. Islam is a wicked religion. And then he goes on about this. So they're upset. Luther was the same thing. Mm-hmm. That actually, the Pope is worse than the Sultan. Mm-hmm. But Islam is really bad. So there was always this obsession with Islam being really bad. And it was along three lines continuous through the ages, through the century, has to do with the position of the prophet, which explains to me why we're so obsessed, so fixated on the prophet all the time. Mm -hmm. Position of women, which explains to me why we're still obsessed by the position of women in Islam. And Islam as a belligerent, aggressive religion. Now, these three things have been part of our mindset for centuries, and we see them, that's the undercurrent of who we are. Now, we are all of a sudden confronted, especially in the West, Western Europe, with the presence of Muslims. Mm -hmm. But every time something happens that touches on one of those three preconceptions, it fires up. So when we, I don't know how it was here in Poland, but we had about 100 Dutch people, perhaps more, who went to ISIS. We had some. Well, that really, so and then all of a sudden was, oh, you see, it is an aggressive religion. We cannot trust them. Before you know it, they will, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, as soon as something, some Muslim community becomes very orthodox, not unlike Christian orthodox, because we have some serious Bible Belt orthodoxy in, in, in the Netherlands, or Jewish orthodox. But when it's Muslim orthodox, it's, oh my God, we need to save the women. Mm-hmm. We don't save Jewish women. We don't save Christian women. Christian we women, save yeah. Muslim women. So it is these things that come up time and time again. So that's, that's the way I see it. It's the undercurrent from centuries. Because overall, I don't think people are Islamophobic. I don't think people are so... There is this, the general tendencies to, okay, well, let's, let's go for it. But as soon as something happened that touches on this, we go to the... I sometimes do a kind of mind game with my students. I say, okay, if I say Hinduism, what do you think about? And they say, well, it's Nirvana, and they think all these gods and, and these... Uh, this is interesting. So you don't think widow burning, caste system, these kind of things. When I say Islam, what do you say? Well, it's just terrorism, women oppression. Uh, interesting. So it's the first instinctive sentiment that counts. And that's really too bad for the Muslims at the time. <laughs> but the element of definitions of Islamophobia or anti-Muslim racism or however you call it, but the part that is in there, so the bias part, is that people internalize stereotypes about, let's call it that group, but there's this emotional part in it. So it can be, you know... it can be different emotions, but usually these are negative. But I would say that explains why there is this lack of distance and self-criticism when we think about Islam and, let's say, women. We saw that now with protests in Iran, at least in Poland, we saw that. So something happens, something about women's rights. And then we don't remember about our own situation in our own country, for example, with abortion rights. Or we don't remember that about what the church says about women in the church and how they should be treated in marriage and whatever else. But it's, again, saving the Muslim women and the headscarf is oppression and they're, we need to save brown women and the liberal feminism is using that. But then again, when we look, for example, at the judgments of European Tribunal of Human Rights in cases of women in Europe who are wearing or wanted to wear headscarf and not be oppressed because of it in Europe, then the women who are fighting for their right to choose and wear headscarf are treated as dangerous for European values. But there's always, there are some feelings about it. And I think it's very, if we are not able to separate, I wouldn't call it fear, but 
separate the feelings, negative feelings toward Islam and these elements, this, these currents that you're talking about, we are not able to even have a normal discussion. No, no. And I, I agree with you because the discussion starts on the wrong foot because there are already preconceived notions on one side. And they're emotional. It's not Very knowledge. Emotional, but it's even beyond. It's not only emotional. It's also, it's like a self-evidence. Mm. Very often discussions by any kind of people would say, wouldn't you say that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that means, okay, so I have to, you're immediately, I, I've not, my work, so as an academic, I would say most of my work is in the public domain. And most of that work is defensive. Mm -hmm. I have to explain that something is not what people think, which makes me, has made me a defender of Islam, mm -hmm. which is a position I don't want to have, but I do, which is very odd. And that makes a lot of people suspicious of me because, oh, well, he's always defending Islam. So he is preconceived pro-Islam. <laughs> and then they can criticize you and call you apologetic. Apologetic Muslim lover, blah, yeah. blah, blah. So they can never do anything wrong. I would actually say that what we're doing, because I'm doing the same, is defending knowledge about Islam. Because I, sometimes I have a feeling that I'm defending my scientific work. I'm defending my research. And it it blends in. Yeah. No, I, I, I think I do it different. I, all of a sudden I become a lawyer. Mm. And I become the lawyer in the sense... So, for instance, we have had these discussions on so-called Sharia courts, which we don't have. But I created an enormous uproar by writing an op-ed article. I said, okay, wait, what, whatever we think about Sharia court, the fact that Catholics have their own courts, well, they do. Mm -hmm. so Catholics, Jews, Protestants have their own courts. I talked to one of those leaders of a Protestant court. I call him the Mufti, of the, the, the Protestant Mufti, right? Who is also a judge in the civil court. Very distinctive man, so if that, why, why would we deny? So it's the equality question. And people became furious, very emotional, mm -hmm. as you just said. And, 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 and I, I said, you know, I don't mean with the Sharia court that we're going to have public ex execution on the inner court. And the, and that, that's yeah. not, we're talking family courts like they have. And well, let's face it. There's also the freedom of religion. So. Women in, cannot become priests in the Catholic Church. It's against our constitution, but that's the freedom of religion. Women are in Protestant communities in the Netherlands are not allowed to have administrative functions. Jewish women cannot get a divorce. It's all part of the freedom of religion. So why are we so... So I take the legal approach. Mm -hmm. if, if we allow all of this, if this is part of our freedoms, we have what I find... And then I all of a sudden become a Dutchman and very much a European. One of the things that I, very, I hold dear, so I might, having lived in the Middle East, what I hold dear here is the freedom to be different, the freedom to be who you want to be. That includes being someone that a lot of people will disagree with. So if I'm an adult woman and I want to live in a, in a Jewish marriage or an Islamic marriage, and every other person would say, if you're a sane woman, why would you ever get yourself in such a position because you have lesser rights than any it's her choice so I, I take very much the I call it the legal legal liberal I don't know what approach of, okay are we comparing apples and pears here or what, what, are, what exactly are we doing from what framework are you being critical because if and that's what you just said if you look at your own situation it's not that much different mm -hmm. well w we could go into women and if we ever have a real choice in any setting and religion because that's what we also saw with my friend we'll be doing an episode about that anyways but we we saw in the research about polish legal opinions to to judgments given in cases involving in somehow islam uh, and usually it was involving it for example in a way that someone is dating a muslim man and the family courts would be oh, no, 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 this, this is bad. This is bad parenting if you're allowing your daughter to date a Muslim guy. Yeah. And then there's a, there's a comment about not having rights in Islam. So the mother agreeing for her daughter to date a Muslim guy uh, a bit older than her is allowing her to give up her rights and allowing her to basically give 
herself away to slavery. So that's bad parenting. Yeah, we do have a legal judgment like that. It's fascinating. And it's, it's actually, it's about something completely else or should be about something completely else because that was family with other difficulties. But anyways, so there's always this argument of, of not having rights. But at the same time, we don't give the right to choose to Muslim women. And women in other religions don't have a right. But I think we 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 shouldn't go so deep into that because that would lead us totally elsewhere. So I would like to go back again a bit to uh, anti-Muslim bias. Um, I wouldn't use Islamophobia in here. Because from what we are saying or what you are saying about Europe and these currents of negative thinking that have been there for centuries it looks a bit like it's a lost cause it looks a bit as if europeans just cannot really agree with having muslims around because what we are thinking about islam is so negative and is so biased and it has been for so long that it will just always come up in different ways so would you agree that we are basically doomed and it's it's just we have to be biased and we have to somehow just deal with it? No, okay. I don't. I'm an optimist in the sense that we, we will always live with biases and stereotypes and that kind of thing. So that's one thing. I think what works against us is the times that we live in. And we happen to live in times when identity has become one of the main issues. And, and Muslims kind of spark that issue. What I find so interesting about most European countries is that they have, and politicians in particular, but the countries, there's this sentiment of, a, of a, the ideal of some kind of homogeneous society, an ideal situ- uh, society that we once were. We're all white and we all had the same traditions and we all sang these folkloric songs, and which is completely untrue, but that's we hold on dear to that. And for a lot of countries, even for France, I realized, I thought France really knew their identity. No, they had a long discussion about what it is to be French. One of the problems I find with these kind of discussions is that it's so hard to define identity. So what people usually do is to define it in ways on what it is not. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it means to be a man. I know it's not a woman. I don't know what it, you know, these kind of things. And that's when Muslims come in. And they very much play a role. One of the things, I, I recently finished a small booklet in, in, in Dutch, in which I kind of try to describe the history of the, the past 20, 30 years and all the ups and downs and everything that happened. One of the most interesting parts is that Muslims do not have a voice in this history. They don't take part in this history. They haven't done anything that's even most interesting they are part of the discourse so it's non-muslims white dutch people talking about themselves by means of islam and muslims Mm -hmm. to identify themselves even better the muslims are standing by and watching this and this is all about us but no one asked us no one invites us to join the discussion and apparently we have done all kind of stuff i'm not even aware of that is so in my optimistic phase, I'm saying, especially a long-term, that is a phase of history. We are going through that. And we are gradually all becoming aware that we're not homogeneous societies. It's, we are completely mixed and all of that. And we are realizing it gradually. We'll get there. It's going to happen. We see it now in the UK. We see it in the United Kingdom. Is a very interesting example because... They are one generation of Muslims ahead of us. So there already there are developments taking place that are not yet taking place in the Netherlands because it's a next generation. And that makes a lot of difference. And there's also a difference, I, I would say, between Western Europe and what well, countries like here, like your country, like Poland. We don't have an indigenous Muslim population. It's new. It's second, third generation. One of the, the things that they get really upset about is that they're still being addressed as migrants. So we are not migrants. My grandfather was, but I'm not. I'm born here. So that at the same time, they want to not be addressed as completely Dutch. Yes, I'm Dutch, but, and that comes to but, I'm also Moroccan or Muslim or I'm this and I'm that. 
And that's one of the fascinating things that the Europeans cannot deal with multiple identities. We always have to question, okay, what are you? Are you Dutch or are you Moroccan? That people have to make a choice. They are not making choices. They're both. And we, the Dutch, the homogeneous Dutch, or with that illusion of homogeneity, cannot deal with that. That's going to take another generation. I already noticed my kids don't see that as an issue. It's funny how we cannot stand multiple national identity, because we can, if it's ethnic and national race and nationality, we are learning, I would say, with sexuality, with different levels, we're learning, or with sex, with yeah. gender. Yeah. So we're, we are learning at different no, levels, but, but nationality... Yeah, but you're saying a funny thing. Yeah. Because for us, you're say, nationality, that's okay. But now we are, at least in the Netherlands, we, Mor- Moroccan and Turkish has become ethnic. So that's the solution. So it's mm-hmm. these languages and terminology, they, they are sometimes solutions, but they can mix up things a lot as well. Oh, Believe me, in yeah. Polish law, they are mixing up. Our research is showing that that you know, no one is because race is still considered in biological terms, which is well technically untrue scientifically. But it's a it's a long discussion. Ethnicity is a term that was invented in what like hundred years ago. It's actually a new term that no one really knows what it's supposed to mean. And is it based on language or color of the skin or or personal identity? So it's it's always problematic, but most of the people just are not really aware of the whole discussion behind it. So it's very intuitive to use it. But with nationality, I would say it's also funny because it's also a new concept in the end. I don't know how old it would be, 500 years national state? Not even. Yeah. It's So compared to religion, for example, that would be... What's actually happened, because that's, again, this is... Lawyers speak what we're doing because that's mm. how we call things top down. But what's happening bottom up is that what at least what I, I see now happening in, in Western European countries is that people, especially Muslim people, identify more with cities. So I'm from Rotterdam. I'm proud to be from Rotterdam, right? And 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 rather than being, don't say I'm Dutch. Well, I'm from Rotterdam, and then proud Muslim from Dutch, of Moroccan origin, Berber speaking. <laughs> you get all these. These details, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. And actually, that brings us back to the Middle Ages <laughs> again, because then cities were more important than, than nationalities, which were a later invention. Maybe it's a way to move forward. Because also another question I have is that, you know, we all need to have this other yeah. person that we're seeing somewhere there and we're usually projecting all the negativity. So that's what basically Edward Said said in Orientalism. So Europeans were projecting all the negative and everything that they didn't want to be, so barbaric, uncivilized, and you name it, projecting that in the Oriental other. And then you can look at that and say that the Oriental other is just changing in Europe. So it could be Jews, it could be the Oriental Muslims or Arabs. So the question is, if we get, you know, more open to Muslims, also because we'll have more in Europe, this is what's happening, won't we just find another other that will become the folk devil? And is it is it isn't just a condition of humanity or of Europeans? It's a condition of humanity. We always this this notion of othering it always takes place. So if one of the interesting thing I find is is when in Dutch history we pride ourselves in in tolerance, which meant that we did not kick people out, but mm-hmm. the Protestants were dominant, and there was this distrust with Catholics for centuries, which is not unlike the distrust against Muslims. So Catholics were always asked to prove themselves. Mm -hmm. Prove yourself loyal to the state. Like Jews in Poland. Exactly. And then they say, well, why don't you recognize us first? Mm -hmm. How can we prove ourselves? How can we be loyal to something that is rejecting us? So you get this catch-22 situation. So I was wondering what happened, because that's not really the situation now with Catholics and Protestants. One of the things that I think changed was the war, Second World War, because, and I still have all kinds of books and children books. I know that I, I read a lot of children books about the war. And me and the children books were always written, I realized later, 
were always written by Protestant authors. And I was a kid from a Catholic background, I was reading, and it was always, each book had a Catholic priest who happened to be on the right side. Mm -hmm. And it was always, a, oh, but he's a good guy. Mm -hmm. So that was the emancipation. You're mm -hmm. fighting on the right side, which is possibly also, you know, with one of the, the, the Tatars in Poland. Yeah. Fighting, the fighting thing makes a difference. You're fighting for your country. It's like the um, Muslims in new American movies and TV series. So you, now you get the good Muslim being a policeman or FBI ag yeah. agent. And then, of course, he has to make, you know, a righteous choice because he has to go after his own kind, yeah. either Arabs yeah. or, or Muslims. Yeah. So and then he's the good guy. Yeah. But I think that's how in pop culture we are introducing yeah. and changing. Well, and in reality, it's soccer. Yeah. We, we, there was well, a moment, well, there was a moment that we were, okay, is, is the Netherlands going to play Morocco? Because mm. then it all boils down to a loyalty issue, which I think is the most vicious thing that exists. Loyalty is the most humane thing, but also very vicious because it requires choices. People need to make a choice. You're with us or against us. And that's where the duality of things. So are you Moroccan or Dutch? Are you Muslim? Or not? And when you're saying I'm all, say, no, 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 no. We don't accept that. That's too. E that's the easy way out. And we have to get there. That we are all. One more question, which uh, I just thought about. So, does it make a difference? You think for you, for the Netherlands, that you kind of have a colonial history? No. Okay. No, and so that's this what is everyone, interesting. Yes, because that's what everyone says. Yeah. So for centuries, we, we the Netherlands, we, the Dutch, have been had the largest Muslim empire in the world because of Indonesia. Indonesia has not had any effect, I find, when it comes to the perception of Islam or mm. Muslims. Or, because it was always part of a colonial enterprise and Islam was studied as something of a colonial enterprise. It was out there. Um, And it was always that had something that had to do with Indonesians, more than Islam, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So it has not had any effect. And even more, I think to dissolve this, this what did we call it? Muslim bias, whatever. Anti-Muslim bias. Anti-Muslim bias. <laughs> to dissolve that. that, you cannot do that with the mind. Mm -hmm. It's not an intellectual exercise. It is experience. You need to meet people. You need to... It need to be a coworker, it need to be a student, it need to be your driver, your MP, your your president. Then you say, okay, I trust these people. This is good. This is working. And then whatever they do in terms of Islam, it dissolves. I'm not sure if I agree right now. Like I did always I was an optimist about the it's called hypothesis of contact. So if you meet people, if you meet the other, if you meet the Muslims, you are less distrust for prejudiced, afraid. However, the research we did on hate crimes in Poland, usually it does tell us that people are generally afraid and just using hate speech on the internet, for example, is very general. However, there are also cases, and I think more than I expected, of people who, for example, have Muslim co-workers. And then after alcohol, they start harassing them. Um, which I find very interesting because, for example, when they are sober, they are apologizing again, and they, it seems genuine, which for me would kind of, it suggests that possibly the stereotypes and the bias is so much internalized that it's not enough to know someone because it still can come up if you don't have the breaks because you, for example, you drink and then You will probably see similar thing in homophobic or yeah. in violence against women. These kind of things will be the same So it's thing. deeper. Yeah. Unfortunately. And then that makes me actually worried because that means that, let's call them easy solutions, they don't work. And the, that, that may be, because I would call that education. So internalized stereotypes. So when you grow up, you hear them, you hear stereotypes about Jews, about Muslims. You see that on the media all the time. You don't have any other sources of information, for example, in school. You don't meet anyone. So you basically, your worldview is the way it is. And then you meet someone. So in theory, it 
should be enough that you met a Muslim person, you like that guy, you work with him for two years, it's all great. And that should be enough, but it's not. No, no, it's not. Because very often that person will be the exception to the rule. Mm. Yeah. True. So I agree. In a way, yeah, okay. I agree, but then, then I'm, I'm possibly thinking more in, in the larger numbers. Mm. Yeah, makes sense. And then, Although that would, but, again, make people who are already afraid of Islam or concerned about it would make them even more concerned because to meet larger number of Muslims usually means that we should have yep. in the society larger numbers of Muslims, which brings us to the replacement theory. There's this conspiracy theory of the great replacement. So basically we will all be replaced by new wave of newcomers that are coming here only to conquer through demographics. Yeah. So people are actually really, but really believing that and afraid of that. Yeah. And then... Ties in with the illusion of homogeneity. Yeah. And I find it a very... And that's one of the concerns I do have. I find with all this identity talk about who we are and we are all, I don't know, we're all Catholic, like this, Polish, white, whatever, or we are all Dutch, Protestant. It's almost like a tribal mentality. Mm -hmm. You're part of a tribe. And that's one of the... <laughs> and not so long ago, I found an article that I wrote, an OPET article that I did not publish because it was too late, in which I was from the late 90s. And I said, we should stop talking about Muslims. Don't mm -hmm. talk about Muslims. We are creating another tribe. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to think about my mayor or my prime minister as a Jew, a Catholic, or a Muslim. Why are we introducing these kind of... It's too late. We, we created a tribe of Muslims. And the Muslims heartedly participated. They also created. So it becomes like almost like an ethnic thing, more than Jews or Protestants or Catholics. And that only reinforces this idea of a closed, well, I, I don't have another word for it, a closed identity with certain identity markers. This is who we are, that's what we do. And then the outsider becomes very, very dangerous because they might take over, change, or contaminate, as they used to call it in the Middle Ages. And then when you meet another, if you're afraid of the demographic change yeah. and you meet another and another, you don't change your mind. You don't become less biased. Yeah. You actually become more scared because the the great replacement is actually happening. Yeah. So I think it actually might not be so easy as we sometimes would like to see no, it. Because I, I do agree that there is there is a humane factor. We are people. And, and unfortunately, I think there's progression in how we see things and perceive things, but not who we are. And so if, and again, one of the things I learned in studying the, the history of Islam in Europe is especially in post-Reconquista time in Spain, the way people were treated was the word contamination was used. Mm -hmm. So let the mixing of people and the, the people were then identified in terms of religions. So Jews, Catholics, and, and Muslims, well, they have to wear different clothes because otherwise, so you can see who they are, so you cannot mix. And these kind of things, and that's why I was so much against this notion of being a Muslim. So, you know, this is part of the identifier which sets them apart. Now, they happen to want it, but it's a troublesome thing. It's a very, it's what we do as people. So I think it's time for last question. And I'm thinking that maybe we should go back to the beginning. So your role as an educator, as an academic teacher, and as an academic. So what would you say our role is? Should we just go and teach theory at the university and that's what we are basically supposed to do? Or we have a bigger role, for example, to be a bit more activist or to go out and teach people outside of the academia or should we be the experts speaking outside? Or that's maybe meddling a bit too much, especially if we are white non-Muslim. Most of my teaching takes place outside of university. I even I set up a special an academy in, as, for that kind of teaching, because I've noticed that a lot of people, especially professionals, so journalists, police, diplomats, lawyers, ever, they are in desperate need of more kind of tell us, we need to know, etc. So that's what I do. On the other hand, I'm very strict in the notion that I think we and academics 
we are in the business of teaching, not preaching. Mm. We should be. Exactly. I know quite a few colleagues who are preaching. They are telling students how things, how they, sh- very normatively, how, how they should see things. How they- I'm, I'm much more in favor of, especially when there's young students, to show them the different views that exist in the world. They can make up their own mind, but you have to show them everything. You cannot. So including all the bad views and the bad people, you have to tell them, show them, etc. There's quite some changes happening within the university, especially among younger teachers. They're more into the preaching business. For me, once you start preaching about how you should see the world, it becomes, and that's why I use the word preaching, it becomes another religion. I think we have to be careful with that. That aside, we are teaching, researching in a domain called Islam, which is so topical, it's so much around us, it touches us as well. So yes, I'm taking part in public debates and I try to do that mostly by presenting alternative views, which, and I just told you, that has made me a defender of Islam, which I'm not, I don't see myself like that. I see myself as a defender of, well, European values or Dutch values. What do we actually stand for? Do we treat everyone the same way? That's why I find it so interesting to get involved in those kind of discussions. Because it's, and that's also, because I'm still homesick for the Middle East. But one of the things I could never do in the Middle East is, you know, get on the barricades and stand up for our rights or whatever, even though it's needed more there than it's possibly here. Because I am not Syrian, I'm not Egyptian, but I'm a Dutchman. And there's a lot to be done in the Netherlands and I will do it. Okay, thank you. For the Thank conversation. You. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it and I hope the listeners will enjoy as well. So thank you again and bye. This podcast episode was created as part of the Empathy Project, funded by the European Union. The views and opinions expressed are solely those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect those of the European Union or the European Commission. Neither the European Union nor the Commission are responsible for them. 